Well, welcome everybody to the Fasting Transformation Summit, where we are uncovering the most ancient, inexpensive, and powerful healing strategy known to mankind. We're talking about fasting. And I'm your host, Dr. David Jockers, and I'm really excited about today because we're going to dive into fasting and the implications it has on brain health. We know we have an epidemic of degenerative conditions, neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and dementia. And fasting can be one of the best tools that we can have in our tool belt to help our body to actually rid itself of the inflammatory stress in the brain, to actually help boost up ketones and help support overall brain health. And so to touch on this topic and really dive deep, I brought in one of the world's top neurologists, Dr. David Perlmutter, and he's a board-certified neurologist and four-time New York Times best-selling author. He serves on the board of directors and a fellow of the American College of Nutrition. His books have been published in 28 languages and include Grain Brain, The Surprising Truth About Wheat, Carbs, and Sugar, with over 1 million copies in print. Other New York Times bestsellers include Brain Maker, The Grain Brain Cookbook, and The Grain Brain Whole Life Plan. So Dr. Perlmutter, welcome to the Fasting Transformation Summit. Excited to have you. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, David. Absolutely. And so I know you, you were on our, our uh, Keto Edge Summit. And we talked a lot about ketones and brain health. And, um, you know, obviously that was, that was a powerful interview. People got so much out of that. And so when we're talking about fasting, you know, just kind of to, to start, what has been your experience with fasting and how can fasting impact brain health? I think uh, that there is both the personal considerations, in other words, what have my experiences been with myself, and also what happens in the clinic, what have we observed in dealing with patients. And I think that, uh, you know, just to take a step back and recognize what happens when we stress our bodies by fasting. I mean, here, the body has really over many years worked itself into a groove, into a position where it expects three square meals a day. And, uh, you know, a constant source ultimately or typically in Western cultures of carbohydrate uh, to power the body. And then suddenly that is withdrawn. What is the effect? Well, it represents a stress. Anything that uh, you know, represents a change typically is a stress. And in the case of fasting, as in the case of many other types of body stresses, it turns out to be a good thing. We call this positive reaction to stress by the term hormesis, and hormesis actually uh, has widespread positive uh, effects in the human body, not the least of which are how this particular stretch activate, uh, uh, stress activates uh, certain gene pathways, which are good, uh, which help reduce inflammation, for example, that help the body begin to uh, mobilize other pathways for the generation of calories to keep the body fueled. So uh, I like fasting. I think it's a good way to jumpstart people. Uh, getting back to your comments earlier about you know our ketone summit, uh, this is a good way to really get people into that state of ketosis rather uh, more quickly uh, and really facilitates the body really being exposed to ketones, which is actually uh, very good for the body and certainly extremely powerful as it relates to the brain brain health and brain functionality. Yeah, absolutely. And so let's talk about this epidemic of neurodegenerative conditions. What do you think is the root cause? Like what's, what's similar about all these different types of neurodegenerative conditions, Parkinson's, dementia, Alzheimer's, what are kind of similar hallmarks? Uh, that's an excellent question uh, because mechanistically they're, they are united in that they're all inflammatory conditions. And you know, it certainly goes well beyond the neurodegenerative conditions that you mentioned uh, and includes things like autism, coronary artery disease, diabetes, and even cancer. So at the root of these issues is the process of inflammation. And we recognize that inflammation is accentuated or, uh, or the road is paved for uh, increased inflammation on a diet that limits the availability of ketones and that favors carbohydrate as a fuel source. Uh, inflammation is higher in lockstep with blood sugar measurements and with measurements of what is called insulin resistance. The key to reducing uh, blood sugar and to restoring insulin sensitivity is absolutely powering the body with these chemicals that are brought on 
by fasting, and these are the chemicals we've talked about called ketones. So while it is certainly, I think, the goal of Western physicians to uh, dissect uh, our various medical maladies and try to individualize them, I think it's very important for us to take the step back and look at the broad st uh, strokes, as you just indicated, and ask ourselves, well, if these conditions are all increasing, perhaps there's something related to environment, i.e. lifestyle, that may unite uh, mechanistically uh, the, the genesis of these conditions, why they're worsening with time, not just because our population is generally getting older, but because percentage-wise, uh, these diseases are increasing. I mean, we expect by the year 2030 that the number of people in America currently at 5.3 million will double. And, you know, currently costing us $1 trillion a year globally, uh, this is a very compelling statistic, not just from the emotional uh, cost and the uh, economic impact, uh, but rather just the sheer loss of brain power that we as a culture are experiencing now and going to experience moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. And what, what sort of lifestyle activities are, can we, can we point our finger at as far as contributing to this chronic inflammation? I think if I could fix two things, it would be number one, uh, dietary sources of calories shifting from carbohydrates to fat. Mm. And number two, address send it, sedentarity. What is sedentarity? Yeah. Being sedentary. Uh, people have got to get up and move. And, you know, it's difficult when uh, you work or when you're involved in like, like myself, you know, you're writing a book and you really have a deadline and you have to devote yeah. eight hours at a time to doing this. You've got to be sure that you're moving. I mean, that is so fundamentally important. It seems banal, uh, but in reality, it has huge implications. We fully recognize correlation between level of physical activity and risk for developing dementia, a, an untreatable condition. Senile dementia of the Alzheimer's type offers up no treatment whatsoever as you and I have this conversation right now. And yet those two things that I just mentioned are correlated to a dramatic decreased risk for that condition. So I find that to be uh, compelling. I find it to be a bit of a life mi mission to get the word out that uh, the research clearly focuses on the notion of lowering your blood sugar and becoming more physically active as being keys to dramatically reducing your risk or dementia, again, a situation that offers up no treatment. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a little bit off topic, but it relates to brain health. When you're sitting down and you're writing for eight hours, what sort of intervals do you do? When do you get up and move? Uh, how do you, how do you, like, what kind of nutrition do you have on that day when you've got to really focus, you're diving deep into science, you've got to get work done. How do you, what's your lifestyle like on those days? Well, I do a lot of writing, oddly enough, standing up, mm, yeah. uh, but I'm very uh, cognizant of the fact that uh, I might the be- stand up desk. Period of time. Using. You can work standing up. Yeah. Uh, in my office where I write, maybe three feet behind me, right here is an elliptical machine. Mm. And then right next to that is a sit-up board. And right next to that are handles for doing push-ups. So I'm at that all day long and work and exercise and work and exercise and it works great for me as far as nutritionally uh typically um typically i will fast for 14 16 sometimes 18 hours almost every day uh, that means uh, a lot of the work that i do in terms of writing uh in terms of my academic pursuits are done without eating uh our conversation right now is uh, yeah. well before me breaking fast having break fast breakfast uh, with the exception of having a tablespoon this morning of MCT oil. So mm. not only am I mobilizing body fat to create ketones, but I've used an exogenous source MCT oil uh, of a medium chain triglyceride that is readily utilized in the body to create more ketones. So I'm powering my brain with beta hydroxybutyrate, a very important ketone. And, uh, you know, you tell me if I'm making sense or not. Oh, absolutely. You are. No, I, I like it because, and you're, are you more productive? You feel like you're more productive in the morning? Would you say that that's your most productive time? Or do you feel like there's just no let up? You say, feel you're good uh, in the afternoon as well. 
it's it's difficult to say. Uh, yeah. There are times when I have to do things in the evening, give a presentation, yeah. uh, et cetera, and I find no problem with that. I have no issues uh, with, uh, I believe, being mentally sharp after a meal. But, you know, even the meal is still a very low carbohydrate, higher fat right. experience. So it's not going to take me out of ketosis. Yeah. Um, I test my uh, ketone levels frequently and my blood sugars as well. Tested a couple of days ago, blood sugar was 67. Beta hydroxybutyrate level was 0 0.7. So I'm in, in the yeah. zone. And I would indicate to your viewers that, uh, you know, it's worth uh, seeing how you perform. But don't judge early on. Because a lot of people yeah. who might fast for the first time and or add in some MCT oil, et cetera, um, will have difficulty with it. Uh, because their physiology hasn't shifted over, their metabolism hasn't shifted over to uh, being able to, to keto adapt, yes. to utilize this metabolic pathway to use body fat or exogenous fat uh, as a fuel source. So it does take a little bit, you know, oftentimes a week or two to get into the zone. And then when you power your brain with super fuel, which is what ketones are, uh, you really get to be far more productive. You get to focus uh, on the subject at hand. And what I find is really uh, quite exciting for me is it allows me not only to focus on the subject at hand, but to recruit other information at the same time mm -hmm. and bring other information to bear on a topic that I'm exploring. Yeah, I think that's just a, a really profound point right there because you get a deeper, deeper level of thought about different topics. You, you increase BDNF, and I, know I want to touch, I want to talk to you more about BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic growth factor, and how that impacts it. And what he's talking about there is, is kind of a, like a modified fat fast, where he does a little bit of MCT oil in the morning, and especially for lean people, like Dr. Perlmutter is very, very lean, right? And so it seems to work great. And really, anybody that's trying to go through that keto adaptation period, like you were talking about that first week or two, Adding in a little bit of MCT oil, whether you're doing it to coffee, coffee or caffeine, like green tea, can help stimulate uh, ketones and stimulate uh, better fat burning mechanisms in your body. So you can add it to that, or you could just take it straight up, like he was talking about, and that's going to provide this exogenous form or from the outside form of ketones in your system, which will give you an alternative fuel source um, that can satisfy your brain, and, and you'll feel you'll feel good with that while you're fasting and still breaking down your body's own body fat and creating ketones during this fast. And so absolutely. And then that will help you extend the fast a little bit longer as well. So yeah, I think you make a very good point. I, I would like your viewers uh, in consultation with their healthcare providers to realize that when you make the commitment to move forward with this, that you can ease yourself into it uh, yeah. with something like MCT oil because what you're depending on otherwise when you're fasting, for example, is mobilizing your body fat, which is primarily what we call long chain fatty acids. Mm -hmm. And it's far more difficult to create ketones from long chain fatty acids for a couple of reasons. Uh, in the liver, they have to be bound to carnitine to be activated, and they have to be absorbed through a specific mechanism that involves what are called chylomicrons, whatever. The point is it's much more difficult in comparison to medium chain or shorter uh, fatty acids, which are found in MCT oil by virtue of its name, MCT, yeah. medium chain triglyceride. The point being that is readily available to create these ketones that then you're able to use as fuel. So you got fuel in the tank and you're ready to go. That's and, right. Uh, it's very uh, encouraging for you to feel okay fasting when uh, you've got that backup plan. Yeah, absolutely. And like Dr. Perlmutter was saying, there's this kind of adaptation period where the body and the brain and just the cells and mitochondria have to get used to seeing ketones in the bloodstream before they get good at, at utilizing them for fuel. So just adding some MCT in, it's highly ketogenic. Your body turns into ketones very quickly without a whole lot of energy. And the body starts to get used to seeing ketones in the bloodstream and says, hey, this is a fuel source I can use starts to upregulate certain metabolic machinery so that so that can then obviously use the ketones. And so it can help somebody who's trying to get started with fasting or maybe extend their 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 fasting window and kind of eat in that 
eight to 10 hour eating window, like Dr. Perlmutter was talking about and feel good, you know, if they're doing it in the morning or, you know, wherever they're doing it. So, uh, so MCT can be, can be powerful there. Let's talk about, did you have some, some to ask? Well, yeah, yeah. I'll just couple things. I, I would certainly opt for much longer than eight to 10 hours. I mean, I oh, yeah. Would, uh, yeah. you know, for, for most of your uh, fairly healthy audience, I, I would go, you know, at least, uh, 12 hours. What does that mean? It means you have your dinner at, you finish at eight o'clock and then your breakfast at 8 a.m. You're already fasting. You fasted yeah. for 12 hours, but I'd say try to put it off until noon or one or two o'clock yeah. and really get your, cause you'll be in ketosis. You really will be. And you know, it's a very good state, uh, of, uh, metabolism for the body. I mean, you know, infants are naturally in ketosis if they're breastfeeding for at least the first six months of their lives, a time when the brain is uh, profoundly developing. And, you know, recognize that there is uh, sources of medium chain triglycerides in human breast milk. So yep. we really want to you know, take advantage of that understanding. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, I was talking about the eight to 10 hour eating window or um, eating your meals between that period of time. Yeah, I always say, you know, 12 hours, I call a simple fast because it really is simple. It's like you finish dinner at 7 p.m., you wait till 7 a.m. the next morning before you start consuming anything with calories, right? And then just like you were saying, you know, start to extend that out um, 14, 16 hours, kind of trying to wait, wait till noon before you consume your meals. And that's really, really powerful. And, you know, especially if you are healthy, doing something like an 18-6 can be really, really profound, or you're doing two meals in a six-hour eating window can be really, really good uh, for your body and for your brain. And so let's talk about fasting's impact on the brain beyond just reducing inflammation, which is which is profound, uh, shutting down the neuroinflammasome. But let's talk about BDNF and, and what that does in the brain. Well, uh, so I certainly don't want to sell um, ketosis short uh, yeah. and leave your viewers with just the sense that this is all about fueling the brain. Mm. And, uh, you know, as you indicate, inflammation, et cetera, this chemical, one of the ketones called beta-hydroxybutyrate, which chemically actually isn't a ketone, that's a big surprise, but it's generally considered uh, to be a ketone. Yes, it's a super fuel for brain cells. It powers those mitochondria, allowing them to create these powerful energy molecules with reduced uh, production of free radicals, I might add. But beyond that, we recognize that beta hydroxybutyrate is a powerful, what we call signaling molecule. What does that mean? It means that it binds to cell surfaces and stimulates certain receptors called uh, G protein receptors that then have a huge effect in terms of modulating the immune system, reducing inflammation, uh, and overall providing a much uh, healthier environment for the cell itself. So it's beyond just the, the fueling aspects of the brain cell that, that uh, the beta-hydroxybutyrate is so very important. Uh, this notion of reducing inflammation, I think, is very, very important. And I, and I think the other uh, thing to consider about beta-hydroxybutyrate and why fasting and or getting into ketosis using supplements like MCT uh, is so valuable, it has to do with uh, this role of beta-hydroxybutyrate as a gene expression modulator, i.e. Uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate is uh, what we call a histone deacetylase inhibitor. And that's uh, a fancy name for the fact that it binds to certain proteins that would otherwise lock up uh, the expression of certain genes. And when it binds to those proteins, it opens up the DNA and allows the transcription or the activation of genes that are basically good for us. So, um, you know, it, it's really a very, very important chemical. Uh, the, one of the richest sources in nature of, of butyrate uh, is butter. That's where the name comes from. Mm. So butter is a good food. My goodness, butter is back. Yeah. All those years that we, uh, we, I'll take myself off that list, castigated butter, uh, we were told if you ate butter, something terrible would happen. And we were supposed to eat margarine, uh, but now, you know, we understand that butter, grass-fed butter, uh, organic, uh, organically raised mm -hmm. uh, cows uh, as a source is actually a really good thing because A, it's a terrific source of good fats, things like CLA, but B, it gives you preformed butyrate. So mm. um, fat is your friend. Yeah, absolutely. And grass-fed butter is also rich in your fat-soluble vitamins, retinol, all kinds of good stuff. So yeah, huge fan of butter over here. So when you do break your fast, you know, include butter in your meal. 
And so, um, so let's go back to, obviously, we talked about ketones and the profound effect that ketones have on the brain. Ketones also help to stimulate this compound BDNF that we were talking about. Can you talk more about that? Well, sure. So uh, it's a really good point. And, you know, one of the reasons that fasting and a ketogenic diet are really, uh, um, right now, the huge focus uh, for us in neurodegenerative conditions, as you alluded to, or as you mentioned earlier, is because of the powerful effects that it has uh, on turning on this chemical called BDNF. And that relates back to what I had just mentioned, that um, it, you know, this uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate changes gene expression and can augment or turn on gene expression to create a chemical called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, basically growth hormone for the brain that does several things. It protects brain cells. We all need that. But it also stimulates two other uh, issues. One is called neurogenesis, the growth of new brain cells. Who knew? And also synaptogenesis, or the connection of one brain cell to the next, which is fundamental for learning. So we really want to have BDNF uh, you know, amplified in our bodies. We have uh, BDNF throughout our lives. It declines with age. But we retain the ability to grow new brain cells as long as we're alive. You know, when we're 80, 90 years old, we can grow new brain cells, and we are. So we want to do everything we possibly can to amplify uh, BDNF and continue growing new brain cells. Uh, one of the areas in the brain that this happens aggressively is called the hippocampus, which is the brain's memory center. So the lifestyle choices that increase BDNF include really two things on the top of the list, and they are getting into ketosis and aerobic exercise. Aerobic exercise is powerfully important these days, not just in retrospective studies that look at how much exercise people used to get or get or have gotten recently and their risk for dementia, but even in interventional trials that have put individuals uh, on either a stretching program or an aerobic exercise program, followed them for a year, measured their BDNF levels, memory function, and measured the size of their brain's memory center on special scanning. Uh, and uh, these studies have demonstrated that those who exercised aerobically compared to those uh, who didn't uh, demonstrated significantly increased BDNF, better memory performance, and a larger memory center in the brain. Mm -hmm. That's work uh, at uh, UCLA and the University of Pittsburgh collaborative study, Dr. Erickson. Uh, and that's very, very compelling. You don't have to buy anything except a new pair of sneakers and yeah. change your diet as well. Yeah, and how would you recommend people get aerobic exercise? Would it be like doing maybe an hour of elliptical once a day or something like that, or three, three to five times a week? Or would it be kind of just periodic throughout the day, going out and taking a walk around their neighborhood um, or a combination? You know, to me, uh, getting somebody to do something is the hurdle. Yeah. So I don't care if it's uh, rumba dancing uh, or an elliptical machine or walking uh, or, in my case, running in the elliptical machine, whatever yeah. it is, rowing, swimming, you name it, biking. But you just have to get your heart rate up a minimum of 20 minutes, and I would say six days a week. If, if you can do yeah. seven days a week, so be it. You know, if you're traveling and you miss a day, well, it's the way it goes. But <clears throat> this is a, a, an extremely powerful way of altering your DNA expression yeah. to create this chemical that will save your brain. Uh, and there's no proprietary uh, product that you need to buy here. Just go out and yeah. do it. Yeah, just get out and do it. I know, like my wife and I, we take a walk around the neighborhood every night, right? Every evening with our kids. There's kind of a way that we connect and get the exercise in. We've got hills and all kinds of stuff like that. And I know, you know, I exercise, we both exercise on our own on a regular basis. But I find, you know, telling my, a lot of my, especially the busier, busier patients, just having them get out and try to use it as like a family time where you're able to connect with your spouse or a friend, or even like if you're on a, on a phone call or something like that, you know, get out and just start walking around your neighborhood. Just get moving. Um, can have such a profound effect on your body. You'll feel so much better. And so let's talk about these, some of these uh, neuro compounds like glutamate and GABA, because I know ketones have the ability to balance this ratio glutamate to GABA. 
So can you, can you fill us in more on that? Well, sure. Let me take a step back though. And yeah. you know, um, there is a tendency to say, well, some uh, hormones, uh, neuropeptides are bad, some are good. And you know, over the years, obviously glutamate has been castigated because we know that glutamate does play a role in uh, activating certain receptors in the brain and NMDA receptors that then allows calcium to flow into the cell uh, and ultimately damage the mitochondria. Uh, glutamate toxicity uh, has been looked at by Dr. Jeffrey Rothstein at Hopkins uh, in terms of its putative role in Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, but you know, glutamate is the number one uh, neurotransmitter, so it plays a very fundamental role in the brain as well. Uh, you know, people have talked about, well, you've got to avoid monosodium glutamate because glutamate is bad. Uh, I think MSG is something to avoid. I agree with that. But again, let's not focus on glutamate necessarily being bad or good. And conversely, same thing with GABA. You know, GABA, uh, GABA has been associated with a calming effect upon the brain. That's obviously a good thing. But I think it's, you know, really uh, about balance. And I'm going to take the conversation right now to the gut. And why am I going to do that? I'm going to do that because uh, as it relates to neurotransmitters like others, including serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, to make it more complicated, we now understand that the gut, and specifically the gut bacteria, are playing a central role in the production, the manufacture of these neurotransmitters. And therefore, uh, theoretically at least, uh, but there is a study to back this up now, play a role in the regulation of things like mood. Because if our gut bacteria help to balance or are involved in disrupting the levels of these neurotransmitters, uh, that then has an effect on how the brain works, we got to pay attention to what's going on with the gut in terms of the bacteria and how we treat our 100 trillion bacterial friends in terms of how we nurture them or how we are disruptive towards them in terms of our lifestyle choices. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, GABA, this is really, really key because, you know, glutamate to GABA, I mean, glutamate is kind of this accelerator, kind of helps us think sharply and quickly. GABA helps to just calm us. And so we want to have that good balance. We're thinking sharply and quickly, but not feeling anxious and overexcited. And a lot of people, when they start, when they get adapted to ketones, right? So on a ketogenic diet or fasting, right? They just notice this balance, this, kind of, this mental, emotional calmness that comes. It has a lot to do with that down-regulating the inflammation and the glutamate to GABA balance. And let's talk about mitochondria. because oh, let, let me just take that last thought a little bit further. Yeah. And, and that is because, uh, you know, a lot of people suffer from peaks and valleys, mm. uh, energy-wise, and you talk about balance. And, you know, so many people grab whatever they can for breakfast. Generally, that's a high-carbohydrate meal, yeah. uh, unfortunately. And, you know, there's, there's nothing really great about having a huge high, uh, a huge spike in your blood sugar from having a bagel and a glass of fresh-squeezed Florida orange juice, whatever it may be, which is nine teaspoons of sugar. Uh, you know, your blood sugar spikes, your insulin level spikes, your blood sugars then plummet. And that is the cycling that you refer to. When your blood sugars pl plummet, you are not able to focus. Your mood is a change. You don't feel great. And your only answer is to get your blood sugars back up and you need to do it quickly. Yeah. And you respond by grabbing something at 10 o'clock in the morning, whether right. it's, you know, something out of the vending machine or whatever it's going to be, or you brought something along. But generally, people in that situation will grab a high carbohydrate, probably high in sugar, uh, snack, their mid-morning snack. So they, they're perpetually in this situation where they are cycling between uh, high and low blood sugars. And you're right. Um, that's not the stability, the calmness uh, that allows people to regulate their moods and to focus on the task at hand. It's really looking at comparing that scenario to uh, burning fat as a fuel. And it's akin, in my mind, to either throwing some gasoline on a fire and off it, you know, poof, and it's done, or the notion of an oil lamp where that flame burns at a constant uh, rate throughout the course of the day and, and does its thing. You know, that's where people, I believe, should be, where they're constantly able 
uh, to either tap into the, the foods that they have eaten, which are higher in fat, or, and or their body fat as a uh, depot, repository uh, for caloric um, fuel. So that is the shift that happens when people fast or uh, otherwise get into ketosis. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, just going back to what you were talking about, I mean, I look at you know, preschools and elementary schools and you know, obviously most of the kids, you know, the, the breakfast that they serve or most of the kids, what they're eating is high sugary, high carbohydrate foods like you're talking about. And then it's like snacks, like they have mid-morning snack, lunch, mid-afternoon snack. They're not going two or three hours without some sort of snack. And typically it's this high carbohydrate snack. And I, you know, I grew up going to public school doing all of that. And, um, I, I fortunately never got the diagnosis, but I'm sure, you know, if somebody looked at me, I would have been diagnosed with ADHD. I had trouble concentrating. Uh, I'd always constantly put my head down and just sleep. Uh, it wasn't until really in my early twenties when I started understanding how to use my body, how to work my body as a personal trainer, started understanding nutrition, reading, you know, the, the kind of content that you put out and many other people, Dr. Mercola and whatnot, that I realized, wow, I can actually take back my brain. And then from there, it was amazing because I actually went to the top of my class. So I went from a struggling student to the top of my class by changing my nutrition, changing my lifestyle. And, uh, you know, this is what's going on. So many kids out there, their potential is being, uh, is, is lying dormant and uh, being tarnished because they just don't know how to take care of themselves. And they're in a, in a system that's, that's teaching them all the wrong things. Well, uh, two comments. First, uh, I would have been right there with you in the, in yeah. the ADHD group. Uh, I can assure you when I was a kid, they didn't have that as a diagnosis. They didn't really <clears throat> offer it up as a diagnosis until there were drugs. Oh, then suddenly it became yeah. you know, like fibromyalgia, which we right. in integrative medicine were working on for years, never became you know, part of the public domain until drugs were invented that were utilized for the problem. Uh, but that said, yeah, kids get pounded with sugar even before they go to school. I mean, if you look at the amount of sugar in baby food, oh yeah, uh, we used to, you know, when when we were working all night in the hospital as residents, we used to spend a lot of time on the pediatrics floor just raiding the refrigerator and eating the baby food because it was so. <laughs> sweet. Uh, in the days we didn't realize what we were doing to ourselves. The secrets of ER doctors, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, and so. Yeah, let's talk about the brain and mitochondria. So uh, obviously we know that the brain is the most dense area of mitochondria. So let's talk about a little bit more about what mitochondria are and what happens to the amount of mitochondria and how they function when we're in ketosis when we're doing things like fasting. I think that most of your viewers have heard of mitochondria. The, um, it is in the mitochondria that uh, the fuels that we provide are utilized to create energy that ultimately powers the cell, powers the tissue, powers the body, allows you to perform your mental activities, et cetera. And as you mentioned, uh, brain cells are among the highest in terms of their mitochondria content. There may be as many as 1,000 mitochondria in a given brain cell because the brain utilizes such vast amounts of our energy uh, metabolism moment to moment. I mean, in a resting state, whereas your brain might weigh 3% of your total body weight, it's using 25% of your resting energy as we sit here right now. Hopefully, mine is, hopefully yours is. Uh, but that said, um, I, I think it's really very important to understand a couple of points. First, that the ideal fuel for these mitochondria is uh, fueling them with ketones. Uh, that is the super fuel creating higher amounts uh, per gram uh, of what are called ATP molecules in comparison to glucose. Uh, beyond that, doing so with a reduction in the amount of damaging free radicals in comparison to glucose. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I, there are some other issues with the mitochondria uh, that are enhanced on a ketogenic diet or being in ketosis and they include what is called mitochondria genesis or mitochondria biogenesis, meaning the growth of more mitochondria and even enhancing the process of autophagy whereby uh, these mitochondria are destroyed, which is a good thing. When there are defective mitochondria, we need to have um, this mitophagy happen where 
uh, those bad mitochondria are actually destroyed because then they don't do then two things that happen. They're not inefficiently creating energy and they're not replicating and passing on bad genetic information to the next generation of, of mitochondria. So that's very, very important. And so we've really got to nurture uh, these uh, derivatives of bacteria called mitochondria. Yeah, absolutely. And would you say that the mitochondria are one of the big factors in, you know, when people go into ketosis or when they're practicing fasting, this sort of lifestyle, they have greater resiliency to stress, right? The ability to adapt to stressors around them. Would you credit that to this increased amount of mitochondria and better functioning mitochondria? Because we kind of get rid of mitochondria that are, are, are inferior or poorly functioning and we've got Kind of well, ultimately, guys. yes, but I think that the uh, ability to handle, um, you know, stress is uh, any event that is really aberrant or takes you out of the norm or is unexpected, uh, unanticipated. And I think that just the overall balance of having uh, the brain fueled appropriately really goes a long way towards mm -hmm. keeping that balance and letting uh, stress be less effective. But what we do understand is actually gets back to something we talked about earlier. Stress creates a, a fundamental chemical called cortisol, which <clears throat> is made in the adrenal glands and then feeds back to the brain and ultimately either in a persistent way or at very high levels is actually damaging to the brain's memory center. So high levels of cortisol or cortisol at even a, a more modest level over a protracted period of time leads to death of brain cells in the hippocampus. Mm. On the other hand, we offset that with higher levels of BDNF to grow back new brain cells in that same area. Okay, so getting that right balance there, <laughs> the right amount of cortisol, the right amount of BDNF, absolutely. All right, let's see, What? Um, how about extended fasting? We talked a little bit about intermittent fasting, right, and how you apply it. How about extended fasting? Because I know that there are some interesting studies talking about like a daily, like a, like an alternative day, 24-hour fast done on, on mice and some of the, the profound impacts there when it comes to autophagy in the brain and cleaning up the brain. So what has been your experience? What have you seen in the research with extended fasting? Well, as you may know, there are various clinics in Europe that are offering up, you know, really extensive long-term fasting, I mean, for uh, weeks, and are purportedly demonstrating some pretty significant positive results. Uh, I think a prolonged fast, I think anything more than about three days, really needs to be done under professional guidance, uh, because what happens when you mobilize fat, especially early on, uh, for an individual who hasn't done this uh, before or readily, is that you are offloading a lot of the toxic stuff that you've accumulated that is fat stored in your body over a lifetime, and you can become pretty darn toxic. So I think that's a very important consideration that you want to upregulate uh, your detoxification mechanisms with certain, for example, nutritional supplements, because a lot of people on a prolonged fast do get pretty sick. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So getting that proper, uh, obviously working with somebody that's an ex experienced practitioner with this would be really, really helpful. Getting the liver moving well, you know, opening up all the drainage pathways, really hydrating your body well is the key. You want your body running like a river, not like a, you know, like a, a pond, right? Where it's going to stack. And if, if I may, just uh, even if we're not talking about an extended fast, mm -hmm. You know, even just the notion of getting into ketosis uh, <clears throat> with dietary change, the use of MCT, et cetera, you know, there are some issues that are not infrequent, and uh, they include what we've talked about, you know, that people don't uh, immediately adapt in terms of their brain function, so you have to ease into it for some people. But, you know, there are other things, uh, there's something called the keto flu, and it's actually yeah. very real where people don't oh, yeah. feel tip-top, and I think we can help with that by making sure people stay really well hydrated, have adequate amounts of electrolytes like yeah. uh, potassium, uh, magnesium, uh, even sodium, even salt yeah. Yeah. Um, in their, uh, well, food related or even as a supplement. And finally, I think one of the biggest pushbacks uh, or events that occurs that makes people less likely to want to engage further is constipation. Oh yeah, 
The reason that happens, in my opinion, and I, I'm almost certain that this is true because uh, we can fix it, is because when people are on a ketogenic diet, they really want to cut their carbs. And generally, that's a good recommendation. It's what you should be thinking about. But recognize that dietary fiber is a carb and you don't want to stop that. Yeah. So you're not going to be adding calories to yourself by having good levels of prebiotic fiber in your diet. You're going to be giving uh, bulk to your diet, A, and B, you're going to be nurturing your gut bacteria. Yeah. So by all means, uh, I think focusing more on net carbohydrates so we get rid of the notion that dietary fiber is you know, a carb that's going to keep you out of ketosis and welcome fiber back to the table because um, you know, if people jump into this and become constipated, they're going to say, hey, I want to rid myself of, yeah. of things and not be constipated. And, uh, and it's a real put off for, for certain people. Yeah, constipation is no fun, that's for sure. And um, it's totally unnecessary. Oh, opinion. yeah, exactly. That's right. And so net carbs are your total, total amount of carbohydrates minus fiber and also sugar alcohols would be subtracted there. But the main one we're talking about here is, is fiber. So what are some of the best ketogenic prebiotic foods that people should be including? Well, you know, the, unfortunately, there's some of my favorites. Garlic, onions, leeks yeah. uh, are, are high on the list, really high in prebiotic fiber. Uh, Mexican yam is a real good choice. Jicama, Jicama. Right. Yeah. Uh, also Jerusalem artichoke. Uh, you know, there is some level of prebiotic fiber in most vegetables and even in some fruit. Um, <clears throat> but I would say that if you're going to use a supplement, which I generally do, I like taking a supplement from acacia, acacia mm -hmm. tree, uh, that big tree in Africa that has a big canopy and you see the giraffe underneath it. It secretes a resin or a gum, acacia gum, uh, that is then generally sustainably harvested, doesn't affect the tree, and is turned into a powder that is organic and is sold in health food stores here in America. And it's a wonderful prebiotic fiber which has a really uh, distinct advantage in that it doesn't, like other forms of prebiotic fiber, cause gas. Mm. So yeah. uh, I like acacia gum uh, a lot. Acacia, so that's a great one. And then include all those healthy foods you talked about, leeks, onions, garlic. I like radishes, and radishes are a great one. Um, avocados, also great ketogenic food, loaded. Avocados, one of the most wonderful fruits ever yeah. uh, on the list. Absolutely. And you know, olives, we don't talk, we talk a lot about olive oil. We don't talk about olives. Olives are great prebiotic, mineral rich, trace mineral rich food as well. So, yeah. And, um, you know, in mentioning olive oil, uh, what a wonderful food. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, here is a, here, you know, when you look at what's called the PREDIMED study, where we <coughs> saw the, the health benefits of the Mediterranean diet, PREDIMED study said, well, okay, we'll take the PREDIMED diet, we'll make it even higher in fat uh, by adding nuts or olive oil. Well, the addition of both was helpful, mm. but olive oil even more so in being associated with a profound reduction in people on the Mediterranean diet with added olive oil, added fat uh, in terms of reduced risk for dementia. So olive oil is a terrific food. I would uh, certainly raise the issue that, uh, you know, when you go to a restaurant, you ask for olive oil, almost always it's not olive yeah. oil. Don't be fooled. Restaurants are not going to be giving out high quality extra virgin olive oil. True. Why? Because it's way too expensive. So what I do, and it sounds kind of uh, wonky, but when my wife and I go to a restaurant, we bring a little bottle of yeah. really high quality olive oil. Nobody makes a big deal about it, and we use it yeah. uh, with our dinner. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Our, our, the restaurant I take my wife out to dates a lot of times is Ted's Montana Grill out here because they've got bison, so free range meat, right? We're able to get vegetables, no grains, things like that. And, uh, but the olive oil they have is 50% corn oil, right? right? I'm like, I'm not putting well, that in my body. Corn or canola. And yeah, exactly. generally it's typically 50, a uh, 49% right. uh, corn oil yeah. or canola, and then 51% olive oil, which because it's 51%, it allows them to say olive oil. Mm, yeah. What I, you know, what you can do if you really want to uh, be a bit of a pain, uh, say, oh, by the way, can I take a look at the bottle where it came from? And it's usually a great big bottle. It's usually clear uh, plastic and it, it tells you the contents and then you right. wonder why it's so slippery and doesn't have that little bite at the end of olive oil that you want to look for, which yeah. is an indication 
of higher uh, polyphenol level. So yeah, I bring my own. I mean, it's a, hey. it's a bit unusual, but so am I. What I'm right I there with you. I mean, we bring a little, little bag and we've got olive oil. We've got our own butter. We'll bring our own grass fed butter and we'll put it on there because we want, you know, a lot of healthy fats in our food and yeah, yeah. we'll bring our own herbs too, because they may not have enough herbs. All right. Salt, things like that. So a lot of times we'll do that. And you're, you're right. Nobody says anything about it. And, um, you know, we order healthy meat and vegetables and we enjoy a great meal. So it works out great. Let's talk about how you personally practice. You talked about, you know, uh, a little bit about your intermittent fasting uh, schedule. Let's talk more about that and what your typical meals look like on a, on a okay. basis. Okay. Well, uh, I don't know if there's a strict definition as it relates to intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. I guess it means fasting from time to time. But the, uh, the part that is a little bit uh, open-ended is how long of a fast is that? Is skipping breakfast intermittent fasting? I would indicate that absolutely it is. Mm -hmm. When somebody misses uh, their morning meal and checks <clears throat> their ketone levels at noon, they're increasing, and that's a good thing. Uh, how often do I do that? At this point, it's every day, just about, unless I'm at an event. Um, so I guess I intermittently fast every day. Do I do it ever longer than that? Yes, I do. I'd say probably about once a week. I won't eat until uh, evening time, Yeah. Uh, which sounds a bit draconian, but it's I know my body. It's what works for me. I can yeah. still go to the gym. I can still do everything. I can write uh, and be uh, with the program, but I'm not suggesting that's the best thing for everyone. But, um, you know, that's what uh, I think intermittent fasting is all about. I mean, I'm, I'm right there with you. I mean, both you and I are, are very lean. We're like, I mean, 10% body fat or less. And I actually do a 24 hour fast two days a week. And I always thought that I would lose, you know, my whole life, I've never wanted to lose weight, right? Um, I've always been wanting to gain muscle. And I thought I would lose weight. And I actually find that I'm stronger, I'm more mentally efficient. So typically, like I haven't eaten since yesterday at lunchtime. So typically Wednesday to Thursday, and then one of the days on the weekends. And I've got little kids too, so it helps. When I don't eat dinner, I focus on uh, feeding them, right? Which helps my life. <laughs> but I find that I'm just so much more efficient, so much more resilient doing this. And, um, you know, my, my, I'm, I'm strong, I'm mentally efficient. So I've just adopted this and found it to be a great lifestyle. And it's not like I'm trying to lose weight. I actually would love to, you know, gain weight and yet I still do this and do it effectively. So absolutely. Well, I, I'm going to say that, you know, I've often said in various interviews, I wonder who invented three meals a day, but now as I was thinking about it while you were just talking, I realized <clears throat> that it's not unreasonable to assume that three meals a day followed the uh, invention of agriculture. Why? Because that whole experience really changed the playing field in terms of macronutrients, shifting from high fat, adequate protein, low carb, to a diet that's really carbohydrate, carbohydrate centric. Yeah. So I think because of that, you know, then we had, as I mentioned earlier, these uh, <clears throat> surges in blood sugar and insulin which demand that you cater to that, that you respond to that. Hence, having lunch uh, after breakfast, having dinner after lunch. So I think that uh, the three meals a day thing is an outgrowth of that. And it's, it's, you know, it's not written anywhere that you must eat three meals a day. Yeah. Further, uh, the notion that breakfast is the most important meal of the day, uh, I'm wondering if that came from Madison Avenue and attempts to... Uh, have mothers serve their kids, uh, mm. you know, some kind of high carbohydrate cereal because it's quick and easy, or uh, waffles from the freezer into the microwave. Uh, yeah, I, I was I was a good mom or a good dad because breakfast is the most important meal. Here's a tall glass of milk, tall glass of orange juice, and a, a waffle with maple syrup. Which you know, frankly, show me maple syrup generally that's actually from a maple tree. It's corn syrup. Let, yeah. Read the label, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, from GMO corn, the truth yeah. be known. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you even have like the Spartans, you know, there's a famous movie at 300. And these, these warriors, they were known, they were, you know, well known as, you know, the, the strongest, toughest warriors. And these are people that typically ate once a day in the evening, they feasted, right? And they fasted all day, they feasted in the evening, right? And it's just part of their culture. Um, and they were renowned, you know, for their ability to, uh, to fight and to, um, to endure, 
Endure, yeah, that's great, great term for it. So let's talk about when you do eat, what, what kinds of meals? What are, what are some of your favorite meals? Well, uh, kale is my favorite food. What mm. can I say? I, I don't know why it is, but I, I eat kale every day. Uh, you know, I cook it in the wok, I eat it raw, uh, and avocados. I uh, have avocados every day. Uh, but beyond that, um, you know, there are wonderful books written about uh, foods, uh, meals, ketogenic diet. There's a great uh, book. Actually, I have it right here on my desk by Dr. Will Cole called Ketotarian, yeah. which talks about being uh, on a ketogenic diet and favoring a plant-based diet. Yeah. And I think that really gets to the point of the notion that and if you're on a ketogenic diet, it's basically Atkins redux and you're eating meat and eggs and dairy all day and that's it. And again, that gets back to the constipation issue. No, you need to have lots of fiber. You need to eat lots of low simple carbohydrate foods, which can have lots of total carbs and fiber um, and are full of vitamins. So um, I think those are the important points to think about. I do eat a lot of wild fish because I catch a lot of wild fish. Mm. Uh, I do have some uh, grass-fed beef and uh, free-range chicken. Uh, probably not much chicken. Uh, I do think that eggs are a terrific food, and I probably have eggs almost every day. I drink very diluted uh, kombucha, and um, I don't feel restricted in any way. I mean, I can take a walk and put uh, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, lots of kale, some eggs that are scrambled, put that in, some toasted uh, pumpkin seeds, and then eat it covered with, uh, making me hungry, <laughs> uh, virgin olive oil. And uh, my gosh, I am as satisfied as the day is long. Truthfully, in, in my situation, my wife happens to be a wonderful cook, so I don't do much of the cooking. I'm a good cleaner of the kitchen. <laughs> You're the eater. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's great. So uh, I'm, I'm fortunate in that regard, but <clears throat> we eat a lot of wild fish. As I mentioned, uh, most of it, most of it we catch. Uh, we spend a lot of time living on, as f fate would have it, living on a boat in British Columbia. Hmm. So we catch wild salmon, uh, prawns, crabs, and uh, make sure that we have a source of organic vegetables. Oh, that's really great. Really great. Great diet and great lifestyle there. Catching your own fish and wild caught fish out there <laughs> in the Pacific uh, Northwest there in the cold waters. So really cool. Tons of omega-3s. Uh, salmon's got the astaxanthin, so really, really powerful stuff. Now, Dr. Perlmutter, you are a four-time New York Times bestseller. You have uh, contributed so much to this natural health movement, this ketogenic, intermittent fasting lifestyle. What, you know, and you're, and obviously, you know, you're, you're well established, but what inspires you every day to get up? You've got a great website, blog, you're constantly putting out great content. What inspires you every day to get this content out and make a difference? I think that inspiration really came um, from, uh, asked the question, what inspired me to write Grain Brain? And yeah. what was going on back then is, uh, and here I am practicing neurology, uh, having been in a very mainstream traditional neurology practice, and I realized we were treating symptoms, not treating disease. We weren't treating the underlying problem. And I began to explore uh, what it was that seemed to underlie these conditions. And even back then, long ago, uh, we're talking well before Grain Brain, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, <clears throat> literature was appearing that showed these relationships between an individual's lifestyle choices and his or her risk for developing neurodegenerative conditions where you and I started off today. And I realized that while that was appearing in the scientific literature, no one was leveraging it in the clinic. Mm -hmm. No one was applying that information day to day, face to face with patients and saying, look, here's what this literature shows. You really ought to consider this in that your mother or your father had Alzheimer's or you may be APOE4 positive or whatever reason uh, you may be at risk. And frankly, we're all at risk. Uh, you should consider uh, a dietary change and more exercise, on and on. And over the years, um, I've pretty much remained uh, alone in that pursuit. So I've kind of gotten the, the sense that it's my destiny. Uh, that whole uh, notion uh, was absolutely reinforced when my father died of Alzheimer's disease, and it really solidified um, me. Uh, sensing that this is my purpose in life. 
Yeah. Um, I love the literature. I love connecting seemingly disparate dots in terms of disease causality. Uh, and uh, I'm not here necessarily uh, to curse the darkness, mm -hmm. uh, rather to light this, the candle, to pave the way for uh, people to not suffer personally, to not suffer emotionally when, uh, in that circumstance, when a loved one has been diagnosed with an incurable neurodegenerative condition. Uh, it's a very, very big issue for us that isn't looked at. Uh, I had the opportunity just a couple of months ago to speak at the World Bank about the global implications of the Alzheimer's epidemic. And, you know, somebody has to do this because yeah. it is capturing the planet and no one uh, in general, you know, the population is aware of what's going on in the background. And you opened our interview today talking about the effect of lifestyle choices and it's profound. And so... Uh, that absolutely motivates me. I love science anyway. And yeah. again, when I connect dots that are so far apart and make sense out of them uh, and have these aha moments, uh, I find it very, very fulfilling, very rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, you were an inspiring leader in the functional medicine movement and uh, just the overall ketogenic fasting lifestyle that we're talking about in this summit, you have definitely pioneered and influenced myself and many of the other speakers. So I just want to acknowledge that and, and thank you for all your contributions. And Well, I appreciate people, that yeah. very much. And I, I appreciate uh, this venue and the opportunity to yeah. share this information. Absolutely. And where can people find out more about you? And what kind of projects are you working on now? Well, first of all, to find me, it's drperlmutter.com. Who knew? drperlmutter.com. Um, and I would say, you know, the, the typical social media, Facebook, David Perlmutter, MD. And uh, if people go to drperlmutter.com, we have an extremely robust uh, searchable database of, of uh, research papers uh, that really support all the stuff we're talking about. And I would encourage people to go there sign up for a free newsletter, it goes out every week. What am I working on right now? Uh, Grain Brain was published five years ago and has been fully revised and that'll be coming mm -hmm. out soon. So truthfully, that's done. So uh, nothing more to do there except uh, you know, the marketing of that. I'm editing a book called The Microbiome and the Brain uh, that will be out in uh, early 2020. And that is a book written uh, by 12 authors, each writing an individual chapter from the most well-respected institutions, I think, on the planet. Uh, that's very, very exciting. And then uh, also January to, uh, 2020, I uh, will be publishing a book written with my son, uh, Austin Perlmutter, who is an in, uh, internal medicine MD. And this book is called Brainwash, and it's about uh, reconnecting. It's about uh, reclaiming your good brain and what the influences are in modern society that are really keeping us from that, how to distance ourselves from those influences and regain our connection to being the good people that we really are. Awesome. Sounds, sounds good. I can't wait to get those books and, uh, and read them. I love, love keeping up with all your content and everything that you're doing. So thanks again, Dr. Perlmutter. Yeah. And for those of you guys that are out there listening, if you're getting value out of these interviews, I just want to remind you that Fasting has the ability to unlock the dormant healing potential within you. It's safe, it's powerful, and it just might transform your life. And if you want to get extra inspiration, motivation, and resources, I want to encourage you to consider owning the entire Fasting Transformation Summit for yourself. That way you have lifetime access to it, the MP3s, the videos, the transcripts, everything you need. And it's particularly good when you first start fasting or if you're doing an extended fast to be listening to these kind of interviews on a regular basis to encourage you and give you support. So if you'd consider that, we would be honored and we will see you on a future interview. Be blessed, everybody.